hear these words from Scripture. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not let them be afraid. Friends and family, everyone who is gathered in this place and everyone who is gathering online, welcome as we remember and give thanks for the life of Bob Jacoby and bear witness to the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you are the author and giver of life. We come from you, and in death we return to you. Help us feel your presence with us now. We bring to you our grief because Bob was part of our lives, and we loved him, and his loss hurts. We offer our thanks for all that Bob meant to us, all that he shared with us, all that he gave of himself. We bring to you our relief that for Bob there is nothing left to fear, no more frailty, no more confusion, that he is with you, he is at peace. Come now into the turmoil of our feelings, renew our faith, and grant us the peace that only you can give. Amen. I'm Joyce. David is my younger brother, right back there, and Bob was my big brother. We shared the same roots, the same memories, and even some of the same attributes. I'd like to share a few of those memories at this time. When Bob started kindergarten, he told his teacher he could spell Mississippi. Doubting him, she said, go ahead. He did. And then he said, I can spell it backwards, too. And he did. And I asked him much later how he could do that. And he said, it's easy. You just look at it in the air, and you spell it backwards. When he was six or seven, we shared a bedroom with a large skylight at 10th and College. We'd look up at night, and he would point out the different stars and the constellations and expect me to learn them. I can still remember wondering how in the world he could do that. Around the same time, our parents discovered the older lady across the street, Mrs. McKinnis, who taught piano lessons, and they lined up lessons for Bob. She added an organ to her living room, and Bob often played on it. She was the one who taught him the love of music, and the rest is history. We moved when Bob was eight, and David and I both woke up each and every single morning, very early, to Gershwin or Rachmaninoff or somebody, and so Bob could get his hour of practice in before he went to school. And this went on for years and years and years. Our grandpa Jacoby was a postmaster in Illinois and started showing and explaining stamps to Bob. Bob caught on quickly and soon started collecting every stamp he could find. We all received an allowance, and most of Bob's went to ordering his stamps. And I remember how he waited anxiously for the mailman to come to the door with his stamp order. He had everyone collecting for him, and then he'd put them in his albums. I remember him showing them to me and explaining that, well, this is the King of England, and this is the Queen of Denmark, or whatever. He knew the history of what he was doing, and he tried to teach it to me, but it was way over my head. A lot of those trips to Illinois to see our grandparents were traveled by train from Topeka to St. Louis, and the train soon became another fascination in Bob's life. By the time he was in junior high, he dominated a large part of the basement with a huge train setup on a great big table that my dad had built for him. And he had several trains, trees, tunnels, water towers, small towns, and even a pond. And it was strictly hands-off for us but he'd let us operate the trains under his supervision. His love for trains lasted a lifetime, 
and he has a room set up in his home today just for his trains. We also had family car trips. Bob would talk Daddy into driving to the capitals of every state we entered so he could get a picture. We sometimes drove 100 miles out of the way just to make a quick drive-by at the capitol. We'd get the story of the state symbols, the statehood, the history, and the governor. On the road, Bob would watch for license plates from different states, and we'd all be on the lookout for different tags, and he'd write them down and memorize them. Years later, he laughed with that cute smile he had and said, no one told me that the license plates changed. Bob gave, away, gave me my first 45 record. He absolutely hated the music I listened to and always made fun of it. But one Christmas, he gave me a record by Chubby Checkers, and I don't know if you guys remember him, and we all laughed about it. He said he wanted to give me my first record, even though he didn't approve. Anyway, he still had that cute smile. If you've ever sat through a spelling bee, then you know how excruciating they can be. Sitting there was so painful, waiting for Bob's turn. But the year he won county, I was bursting with pride for him. Thanks to Mother and his teachers, he practiced every morning and every night. We all learned about roots, origins, meanings, and everything else associated with spelling. I'm sure if you knew Bob well, you've been corrected by misspellings and grammatical errors. And Bob always had that cute smile when he corrected you. And the thing was, he was almost always right. Church was a huge part of our lives. We went Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and by high school every Thursday night for choir. Bob was always the one playing for Sunday school, youth club, youth choir, and by high school he was our church organist, continuing through college when he drove from KU every Thursday night and Sunday morning. He took organ lessons from Mrs. Bartholomew, who was a minister's wife at Central Presbyterian, and later with Richard Gayhart, an organist here at first. And he told him that one of the most important things to do was to learn to play the hymns well. And he definitely did. He especially enjoyed our Aunt Margaret, and they both spent a lot of time together, sitting and playing the piano at Grandpa Jacoby's. Dave says one of the most impressive times of his life was attending Bob's graduation at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Linus Pauling, the vitamin C advocate who won two Nobel Prize awards in chemistry and peace, was the speaker. And Bob told us beforehand what an exceptional man he was. The campus was beautiful, and we were all very proud of Bob's accomplishments. This was the pathway to helping so many of his patients in the future. Bob truly loved his family. For many years, we all gathered on Sundays for lunch at Mother and Daddy's. Our children played together while we played games, which no one ever won but Bob, of course. But those were great years. After our father died 18 years ago, Bob again joined Mother and I for lunch every Sunday unless he was traveling, with a church group or at Aldersgate. He always arrived with a hug, and he always left with a kiss every Sunday. His devotion to Mother was wonderful. Every Wednesday afternoon, he went out there to visit her. There wasn't much he wouldn't do for anybody, and I know he was always there for me, all the years of my life, no matter what the circumstance. This last year, we spent a lot of time together cleaning out the music at my church and going to see my mother several times a week. Those were precious times for me, and we shared a lot of memories, joys, and frustrations. He became a best friend, and I loved him dearly. I thank God for being a sister, and he was a blessing to all of us. I'd like to share this scripture that seems fitting for Bob. It's from Ecclesiastes 5, 18 to 20. This is what I have observed to be good that it is appropriate for a person to eat, to drink, and to find satisfaction in their toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life that God has given them, for this is their lot. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and to be happy in their toil, this is a gift of God. They seldom reflect on the days of their life, because God keeps them occupied with gladness of heart. Thank you.
Bob's fraternity brothers have many memories of Bob, especially during the time that we were at school together at KU. My first memory of Bob did not involve the fraternity or KU, and it barely involved Topeka, as my family had only just moved here in 1962, and we had not been here even nine months. My next recollection did involve the fraternity and is of particular relevance to all of us today. After I share those, I will share a few other thoughts and then consider what I think is one of Bob's greatest gifts, which I believe he left for all of us. I have twin sisters, a year younger than me. Uh, we were Irish triplets, I learned at some point. Peggy was an accomplished piano student, and when we moved to Topeka in August of 1961, my mother worked hard to find her the best piano teacher. She did. Peggy worked her way through another year of lessons, and in the spring, she performed in her first recital at the Topeka Women's Club downtown. The Women's Club had a Steinway concert grand. It also had a lovely 100-seat windowed space on the southwest corner. That Sunday afternoon, my other sister and I trooped in with our parents, took seats, and waited until Peggy had her turn to dazzle everyone. Her turn came, and she played beautifully. Piano studios typically order recitals, so their best student performs last. We were surprised to see another name beneath Peggy's on the program, and we wondered just who Robert Jacoby was. Well, we found out. I do not remember what Bob played, but I do remember it was a quantum remove from my sister's recital piece in both complexity and emotion. As vividly, I remember he played with an assurance and a power I had never seen or heard from anyone so young. Two years later, a Summerfield scholar and Topeka West's valedictorian, Bob joined our fraternity pledge class. The KU Greek system had African-American fraternities in 1964, but the White Houses were all white when Bob and I arrived that fall. And they stayed that way for the next three years. In our senior year, our fraternity, Alpha Kappa Lambda, rushed a black student and grew to like him very much. AKL did not have a system where a single no vote would have prevented our asking him to join us. But in the fall of 1967, there were members who were opposed to pledging this young man, and getting the necessary vote at the upcoming chapter meeting was far from a sure thing. As chapter president, it was my responsibility to preside over chapter meetings, that I was outspokenly in favor of extending membership to this black student did not distinguish me from the strong majority of our brothers who felt the same way. But my views did make the members who were opposed or on the fence uncomfortable. And as my term in office had already had its other controversies, I became concerned that my presiding over the chapter meeting could become its own flashpoint for opposition to our candidate. So, I turned to the senior class member whom everyone admired, liked, and trusted, Bob Jacoby, and asked him to run the meeting. Bob agreed to do so. I know he prepared for that meeting, and I suspect he prayed about it as well. We had our chapter meetings on Monday night, right after dinner. That Monday, the tension that had built steadily through the meal and into the short break that followed was palpable as I stood and called the meeting to order. When I told the chapter I had asked Bob to preside over the discussion and the vote on the candidate, you could feel the pressure ease. At least a few members applauded. Over the course of a lengthy, wide-ranging, emotional debate, Bob managed the strong voices on both sides with patience and grace calling for a vote only when he was sure that everyone had had the chance to speak what was on his mind. At the end, the AKLs voted in favor of the candidate, 
They brought an exceptional new member into the house and they integrated the KU fraternity system. Bob graduated from medical school and returned to Topeka. I don't believe he gave a thought to living and practicing anywhere else. Most of you, I suspect, developed your own relationship with Bob after he returned to his hometown when he was Dr. Jacoby. Bob was never my doctor. In that setting, I never experienced his warmth, his quiet and purposeful appraisal of my problem, his experience and knowledge and intuition in treating it, and the resulting feeling, a certainty of getting better that helped so many people. Neither did I witness the ineffable beauty of a newborn child laid into the arms of her mother by a physician who loved her nearly as much as her parents. Bob and I never attended the same church, and he was never my organist. In this church, Bob's church and yours, I never experienced the cleansing anticipation a beautiful prelude can create in those who wait for God to join them. Neither did I experience the sound of your choir rising upon the constellation of notes provided by a man who trained his hands to deliver joy, not only in a surgical suite, but in a sanctuary as well. Bob and I were never members of the same family. And while I knew his parents and his brother, and while I know Anita, I never experienced his steady presence with you, his uncanny awareness of you, his wry, sometimes devilish sense of humor, and his enveloping love, all of which he provided to all of you all the time. But I was his friend. There was never a moment I did not admire him. There was never a day I did not learn from him. And there was never a parting that did not leave me hopeful, hopeful for everyone whom Bob might encounter, but hopeful especially for me. To be a hopeful is to be someone likely to succeed. Bob was certainly that. To be hopeful is to inspire confidence about the future. Bob Jacoby was able to take hopefulness into himself and pass it on to others. There was no patient, no colleague, no family member, and no friend who on meeting Bob was not more confident about their future. Leaving here today, we can all be hopeful. That was Bob's gift to us, and he would want us to keep it.
we pray. Eternal God, your spirit inspired those who wrote the Bible and enlightens us to hear your word fresh each day. Help us to rely always on your promises in Scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It is he that made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. When I hear the verse, make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, I can't help but think of Bob. He was so talented, so passionate in his playing, so committed to promoting this church's tradition of excellent organ music that when I first began serving this church six years ago, I just assumed he was Dr. Jacoby because he had a doctorate in music. And I was shocked to learn more than a year later that Bob was actually a retired family physician. Bob himself never bothered to mention this. Raise your hand if you're surprised by that. Sitting down to think about Bob and this little portion of today's service, my mind has been flooded with image after image of all the ways Bob embodied the joy of making music and the way he so generously included us in all that joy. The way he would belt out the opening hymn as the choir processed down the aisle at the beginning of each worship service. The way you could always tell, you could always tell if Bob was at the organ without even looking because of the way he always took full advantage of every part of that magnificent instrument. Joy bubbled through his fingers and into the keys and the pedals and flowed out through the pipes and into our midst. We could hear the Holy Spirit tapping her toes when Bob played. When we sang the Gloria after the assurance of pardon, we knew our sins had been forgiven. And we knew through the exuberant way that Bob played that we were beyond a shadow of a doubt the beloved people of God. Bob loved the organ and spent countless hours and much energy making sure we took proper care of ours Yet his love of music and people ran so deep that he acted just as delighted to play the humble, rickety, upright piano at Presbyterian Manor when it was our turn to do Vespers. We could count on Bob. I know we took him for granted. I knew, I didn't even have to ask, that he would be there to play hymns for new Noels every December. Knew he would say yes the day we didn't have any entertainment for our silver wing suppers and needed some emergency piano music. Knew that if our organist was unable to make it for a funeral or a wedding that Bob would be there, provided he wasn't off traveling the world with Anita. And speaking of Anita... We owe her our heartfelt thanks. Anita is one of the reasons that Bob had so much love and joy to share with the rest of us. Of all the wonderful stories Anita shared with us recently, my very favorite, the one that moved me the most, is the one about the time when she and Bob had been together, oh, 10 years maybe. And Bob shared with their Sunday school class that being married to Anita 
felt like being in heaven. He had spent so many years alone, and in Anita, he finally had the companion he had always longed for. It was Anita who explained to Pat and me last week that the reason Bob didn't become an obstetrician as much as he loved helping mothers deliver their babies was he just couldn't bear the thought of missing out on caring for the children and the elderly and everybody in between. He was famous for his exceptional listening abilities and his willingness to take as much time as was needed to help someone feel heard and understood. Bob saw the best in people. Where others saw an inconvenience, Bob saw an opportunity. One time, Bob got a call from someone who was looking for an organ teacher for their 94-year-old father. You know, people do not line up to teach 94-year-olds how to play the organ. Well, then somebody called Bob, and Bob said, hmm, well, that might be kind of fun. So Bob actually managed to get in a couple of lessons with the man and taught him how to play home on the range on the organ before the man passed away. Bob saw the best in just about everything. Even our global pandemic couldn't get Bob down. The last time I saw Bob, our staff was gathering together for lunch, as we occasionally do. Bob never missed those. We were talking about the state of things, how tough things are for so many people right now, how different life has become, how quickly things have changed. And Bob listened quietly, as he always did. Well, then he spoke up and said, well, you know, I still wake up in the morning and think, wow, what a beautiful day. Today, as we remember Bob and his love for this world God has made and all the people that are in it, we say, wow, what a beautiful human being. Thanks be to God for the gift of Bob Jacoby. Scripture reading from Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. As a general rule, it is a disadvantage to write a reflection about someone knowing that a number of other people are going to say something ahead of you and that you will follow all of them because you run the risk that they're going to use all the good stories and all the great remembrances of that individual and that they'll say everything there is to say about that. I wasn't worried about that today because Bob is just one of those fascinating people, an individual about whom you continually discover new things and no one could possibly 
with the exception of need to know everything or say everything about Bob. I've known Bob for nearly 20 years, and even today I found myself hearing stories and saying, I never knew that. What I find most captivating in all of these stories, all of the accomplishments, and all of the the remembrances is the source from which they sprang, and that is what I would like to reflect on today. In thinking about Bob, the reading from Galatians quickly comes to mind because If you had just nine words that you could use to describe Bob, it would be love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. They just naturally quickly come to mind when you think about Bob. Bob was a man filled with love that gave him joy and peace. He was patient and he was kind with a generous spirit. A gentleman in every respect, he was deliberate in fully living into the faith he knew every day of his life. These qualities are what the Apostle Paul refers to as the fruit of the Spirit. In saying this, Paul meant that one cannot cultivate these things in themselves. But rather, it is God's Holy Spirit that does the cultivating. And thus, the manifestation of these is proof that the Spirit is cultivating good fruit in an individual. Things like being kind and patient were not things Bob had to work at. They just came to him and that such fruit abundantly sprang from Bob is a testament to the work of God's Spirit in him. As accomplished as he was, Bob never took for granted the blessings in life. If you read the obituary printed in today's order of worship, you can see how blessed he was. And you'll see a man making the most of the time he has been given. Bob was always doing something, and quite often he was doing multiple things at the same time to squeeze as much extraordinary into a day as he possibly could. Delivering 2,700 babies, now that is something, a noteworthy accomplishment. But maintaining a collection of books with Photographs of those babies, well, that is extraordinary. What strikes me most about Bob, though, as everyone here has mentioned, is his humility. He constantly displayed a humility about himself. I think that's one of the reasons each of us keeps saying to ourselves, I never knew that about Bob. Bob was the kind of guy who could be honored as the Kansas Family Physician of the Year and not really make a big deal out of it. You know, there are people in the Bible throughout whose name we widely recognize. Moses, David, Mary... Paul, to name a few. And then there are those people whom when we know them, we may not know their name, but we know their action changed history. The little boy who shared his lunch with the disciples so that Jesus could feed the 5,000. The woman who used her tears and hair to wash the feet of Jesus, giving him the opportunity to teach about the heart of forgiveness. 
We may not know their names, but we remember their stories. And I think it's kind of like that for Bob. We don't know all of the accomplishments of Bob, and he was quite okay with that. I think he understood that God didn't create him to be famous in the world. God created Bob to be a very special person in the world. Bob didn't seek name recognition. He lived a fruitful life. And he let the record of that life speak for itself through his colleagues, through his friends, through his family, and through people he touched. Times like this are so very bittersweet. We grieve Bob's passing, and yet at the same time, we remember all of the greatness he brought into our lives through his journey of faith. His passing challenges us to come to grips with the mortality of life. It pushes us to find purpose in our own lives. It produces within us the need for something more, something bigger than ourselves. Like the promise Jesus made when he said he will return and gather those who have fallen asleep with those who are still awake and we will all be gathered together with our Lord and Savior. In that promise, we find comfort. God is faithful and there is encouragement knowing that Bob's earthly life in Christ has led him into the divine, the eternal life with our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, this is not the end of Bob's story. It is the beginning of a new journey, just the sort of journey that Bob would love to do. And death is not the end of our story either. So while we grieve Bob's passing, mark the end of an amazing earthly life. Realizing how much we will miss him and miss the good old days, We can also be confident that death is not the final word. The story of Bob's life, along with the story of our lives, continues. This past week, the truth that's found in a long-known idiom came to me as I was thinking about Bob. It says, what matters is not the amount of days in your life. What matters is the amount of life in your days. Bob filled his days with so much life and in so doing blessed each of us. Thanks be to God for that.
we pray. God of life and light and hope, with your whole church in heaven and on earth, we bring you our thanks. We offer to you our praise for all that you have done through the ages, through Jesus who is the Christ. You gave him to live and die for us. You showed your plan for the world and proved that your love has no limit. And on that first Easter when you raised Jesus from the dead, you promised that all humankind might share his resurrection life. For the hope of our faith, for the good news of your kingdom, and for all those whom you have welcomed into your loving presence, we thank you, gracious God. But especially now, we thank you for the life of Bob, whom we loved. We thank you for all the ways in which he became special and precious to each of us who knew him. For the values and standards he set himself and lived by for his sense of what was good and right and decent for his warmth and his humor and sense of family for every life that he enriched and all that he invested of himself in others for the faith by which he lived and in which he died we thank you for the glorious treasury of memories that are ours to keep to hold on to and to enjoy the moments that were deep, special, and personal, the times that rang with fun and laughter, and for the ordinary days of discovering each other a little more with affection and love and trust and respect growing and deepening. We thank you for his life fulfilled and for all that Bob reflected of your goodness and love. And we are thankful that Bob has found peace and will neither suffer nor mourn again. He has laid his burden down before you and is with you, whole and welcomed by those for whom he once mourned. Help us to hold on to what we should and to let go of what we must. Help us not to cling to the past, but rather to take forward what he gave us for the rest of our lives' journey. Help us to trust and to know that Bob will be close by until that day when we all shall stand together in your presence. And now with the confidence of the children of God, we pray the prayer Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power of the Lord forever. Amen. O oh, merciful Savior, into your hands we commend your servant, Bob. Acknowledge, we humbly pray, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a man of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.
little something about that piece. Um, the organ has the ability to record the keystrokes and the settings of the organ as somebody's playing it. And Bob's apparently the only one that figured that out. But he played that. That was his piece that the organ just replays. I have been advised that you are unable to exit out the uh, east side of the building, street side. So um, we will ask everybody to exit through the north, through Disciples Hall as you, uh, as you leave. Go in peace and serve the Lord.